Shall we begin? I got 6.32. Evening. Um, this is a presentation by Chris Berg from Wright Pierce. Uh, he will do his presentation. It will be on the screen. Uh, we kind of like you to hold your questions to the end if possible. And please use the microphone because I know you can hear yourself speak and probably the person next to you, but we, not necessarily everybody in the room. So we ask you to use the microphone to kind of stand up and say something. Okay? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vern. Um, again, my name is Chris Berg with Wright Gears Engineers. Uh, we were engaged by the district to um, develop an asset management plan or work with the district to develop an asset management plan for the water system um, in uh, 2018. And we wrapped up our work recently in May of this year. So uh, this presentation is a summary of uh, the asset management efforts uh, or asset management plan coming out of the, this effort. All right, so um, a couple of introductory slides sort of some definitions. You know, what are assets? Um, assets are really uh, resources with value that provide benefits. So in a water system, they're really kind of fall into two different categories. We've got distribution system assets, which are pipes, valves, hydrants, um, water services. If you want to go a little further down into the, the mechanics of things, there's also um, water meters, backbow friends, prevention devices, curb stops. But really kind of as part of this effort, we'll sort of stop at water services and leave that as a as an entity unto itself. Um, on the facility side of things, um, there are assets like tanks, the well, um, buildings, and then the, the equipment within the building. And uh, those can get broken down into different systems and different components. So from asset management, so what is asset management? Of a generally, um, accepted definition of asset management in relationship to a water and wastewater system. Um, it's a systematic process of operating, maintaining, upgrading, and disposing of assets cost-effectively while maintaining an appropriate level of service that's acceptable to the customers. So again, so looking at how we did our evaluation and how we went through our study, we looked at what the existing infrastructure was. Um, identified an inventory of the existing assets. We worked through documenting the condition of the assets. Um, we worked on level of service and defining what an appropriate level of service was for the utility. Um, we looked at risk analysis, uh, defined define likelihood of and failure, likelihood of failure and consequence of failure of these assets. Um, calculated business risk exposure for um, it, both the distribution system assets and the facility assets, um, and then took a look at prioritizing um, capital improvements associated with, with the, the district and looking at how those things are going to get serviced in the long run. Is it a, re a replacement? Is it inspection? Is it monitoring? Those types of things. Uh, and then develop a capital improvement plan around um, moving forward with that. Uh, Move forward in the district on how we can uh, both improve and maintain uh, the existing level, existing infrastructure with the appropriate level of service moving forward. Um, and we'll talk. I'll talk more in depth about level of service, what that is, uh, the likelihood and failure, likelihood of failure and consequence of failure and exposure in a little bit. So, uh, getting into the districts, some of the district specific stuff. Uh, District for the water treatment system relies on a couple of different wells. We've got two bedrock wells on Foundry Street, and that's often referred to as um, Porter Well. It was treated for uh, removal of arsenic and benzene. The benzene system is offline at this point in time because there hasn't been detection of benzene for a while. Uh, there's one gravel pack well on Sullivan, and General Sullivan is referred to as the General Sullivan Well. It's treated for pH adjustment and disinfection prior to uh, sending that water to distribution. Uh, the distribution system is about six miles of pipe, with approximately 60 hydrants. Uh, the distribution system water main system, uh, 
sizes vary from an uh, inch and a half up to 12 inch diameter water mains. Uh, some of the older pipe in town is, is all cast iron. Um, some of it was installed near the mill and, and outside of school. The, near the mill in particular is where the oldest stuff in town is. Uh, other materials in the system are uh, asbestos cement pipe and ductile iron, and there's some other pipes. The district doesn't, doesn't have a good understanding of what those materials are. Uh, and then there's a water storage tank that was installed back in 1996. Is that correct, Vern, roughly? Yeah. Um, and that is up back by the uh, Rollinsford Transfer Station. So um, looking at it geographically, your storage tank is up by the transfer station here. The wastewater plant is down by the river at Porter Well, down well just up the street here. Uh, and General Sullivan felt this way. We've got a six miles of pipe in our distribution system and about 600 service. So operationally, uh, General Sullivan Well is the primary well, primary source of supply for the district. Uh, it's got good water quality, also has um, both SCADA and communications to the facility, so that we can, there's remote, uh, remote uh, communications to that well. So uh, back at the wastewater plant where our operations are staffed, understand what's going on at that, at that well. Porter Well is a secondary well. It's used in periods of high demand, like the summer. Uh, and there's no remote communication um, at that facility, which makes it difficult to operate that on a continued basis. Uh, polyphosphate and chlorine are added both wells for corrosion control and disinfection. Uh, hydrofluoric acid uh, is added at Porter Well to adjust pH. And we've got arsenic treatment at Porter Well with the addition of ferric sulfate for a co-precipitation process to remove uh, the arsenic particular. So, um, we've got all these assets, right? We, the districts and uh, the rate pairs have invested a lot of money in installing it. So, there's a cost. What, what's it worth? If you replace the system today, roughly $12 million worth of assets that are in the ground. About a million bucks a mile for water main. I'm oh, sorry. Roughly about a million bucks a mile for a water main. About six million dollars, and then add up the other the cost, potential cost of replacement for those other. You got, there's a lot of assets. There's a lot of cost um, that the, that this system is worth. you are looking at it on replacement value. Um, level of service. So level of service is really what is defining how the utility owners, the managers, the operators, and the customers all want the system to reform over the long run. So uh, as part of this effort, we had discussions with the, both the district um, commissioners and the, and the operator and developed a, a level of service agreement that uh, put forward things that are, a lot of this stuff is, is stuff that's regulated upon. Uh, particular. All that state, one of the things you need to do is meet all federal and state water quality regulations. So that's something that we want to adhere to. And so we want to make sure level of, these level of service items are measurable and how often do you measure them. So we'll be able to measure and track these things. Right. Another one um, I highlighted down here is meeting secondary standards related to aesthetics for the system. So is it measurable? Yep, you can do that. And how would you measure that? How would you report that? You can report that as part of your CCR. Uh, another thing we provided as part of uh, the deliverables with this product is a progress towards meeting goals uh, spreadsheet. So again, all the goals are listed on the side, what the target levels are, what the frequency, you know, the frequency you measure and are, what the data is, the goal met or not, and then comments. Because a lot of a lot of times, especially on the front end of this process, you may not necessarily be meeting the goals that you're setting for yourself. But um, that's okay because you're measuring, you're figuring out what you got. You have the processes in place to measure the things that you want to. Okay, if you don't, can you, can you measure those things? Yes, very likely you can. But you can need to set those processes up to to make those measurements. So. At the end of the day, 
you can be meeting those goals in the long term. You know, so meet them in year one, but you can get there in year five or year ten. One of the other things we did was a storage tank analysis. So currently in the whole tank, you've got about 750,000 gallons of, of, of available of water. The top third of it is really the active, current active storage. So what I mean by active storage is there's a, basically this dead body that the water that you're using sits on top of. There's water there to support the water that you're using. So you've got your current average day demand is about 0.1 million gallons. And you can have 0.34 in active storage. It's a little less than what we'd like to see. But given the nature of the system, and the size of the system, and the size of the demand, um, it's appropriate. So we recommend maintaining your system storage um, for, what, for the, the system that's in place. Uh, one of the way other things we did with distribution system analysis. So we looked at maximum and minimum system pressures, uh, fire flows, reliable. We looked at pipe looping systems, generally well looped. Uh, there's a couple of dead ends that you could spend some money to fix, but you don't necessarily need to. Uh, looked at reliability, redundancy, criticality, uh, pipe velocities. I want to make sure that uh, Generally, we keep pipe velocities below a certain limit so that we're not disturbing uh, any sediment, potentially maybe in the pipes. Uh, and water. Is there uh, is the water in the system aging to a point where you run into disinfection byproducts or water quality? So. Generally, uh, a lot of these characteristics that we went down through here, the distribution system is, is generally in, in good shape in Rollinsford. Yeah, there's a couple of areas where there are some, some low pressure. Um, there aren't necessarily any pressure areas where we have we see pressures that are um, high, where, high enough where it would be uh, an issue where we'd recommend uh, developing a pressure zone. There are a couple of low pressure areas in particular uh, up on spruce. It's a little bit of low pressure. Sorry. Um, my apologies. I'll talk more directly into the microphone. Uh, so look, there's a couple low pressure areas on spruce feet and also up on, on water. But beyond that, the distribution system is generally in pretty good shape. There are some fire flow things that we can, the system can work on, but uh, those are sort of long term questions. The source water evaluations. The district currently has two wells, um, and there are potential for additional sources, especially given the nature that the district has. With this, let me back up again a second. Um, a couple of years ago, there was some lead copper problems in the in the district. Um, and there's also uh, currently a, I'm sure everyone's uh, familiar and aware of the some of the water quality issues on Lily Street. Um, between the two, the water quality coming out of the two wells is, there are different, the district is managing uh, the, as best they can, the water quality in the two wells and trying to make them as uh, compatible as they can. But potentially in the long run, there, it may be benefit of looking for an additional source or a different source that's more compatible with either one or the other well. Those, your options for that are either connecting to Summersworth, uh, connecting to South Berwick, or developing an additional groundwater source. That would be from a, if you wanted to have the most control on it, you would potentially look for an additional groundwater source. There's a little more risk there because you don't necessarily have a well out there to go get. You have to find it. You have to look for it and it has to be there for it to develop. So um, those are things that moving forward we want to we recommend the district to look into from an evaluation of the facilities um, Porter Well in particular. There's a couple of recommendations at this facility that we're recommending installing remote communications SCADA at the facility, uh, installing online pH and chlorine analyzers, uh, integrating PLCs so that automated chemical dose adjustments. Uh, 
there's some HVAC improvements, corrosion in the facility, and constructing some additional space to house lab space, um, appropriately separate chemicals, and uh, provide some additional chemical containment. At the General Sol Solomon Well, looking at installation of um, pH and chlorine analyzers again, and integrating PLC for automated chemical dose adjustments. And you can see that that's at both of those at both of the facilities. The reason for that is so that we can, when you're operating both of those wells at the same time, you can best match water quality between the two wells to reduce um, water quality issues out in the distribution system. Um, and then at at General Sullivan in particular, we've got, there's some um, electrical system protection we're looking at. Uh, the electrical system is in the basement of this facility, the flood sensor and sump pump, protect that electrical system, and some, uh, some transient voltage uh, surge suppression as well to protect that VFD. So from a risk exposure analysis thing, we use this, uh, this, uh, this goal business risk exposure. So really combines a couple of different um, measurements of risk. So we've got the likelihood of failure, which in this application, we look at the physical condition, operational performance, reliability, availability, and maintainability of an asset, um, and roll that into a likelihood of, fa of failure score. On the consequence of failure side, we look at loss, potential loss of service. Is there public health impacts? Uh, what are the social impacts, environmental impacts, uh, or legal or financial impacts of an asset failing to the district? And that multiply the likelihood of failure score times the consequence of failure score, and you get your business risk exposure score. So um, this, these two graphs uh, show both the distribution assets and the facilities assets um, on a graph. So we've got consequence of failure on the horizontal axis and likelihood of failure scores on the on the vertical axis. So you can see there are on the facility side of things there are a number of assets that are in the medium risk category, but most of the assets are in the low risk category. On the distribution side, there are a couple of ass assets that are in the high risk um, category, but most of the assets are in this medium to low risk um, category. So. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, from another, looking at it from another perspective, um, here geographically, matched out. So that the highest risk assets are really the assets that lead um, down into the downtown district, which makes sense. And that's where there's um, commercial activity, the loss of service down there. Um, there's also higher pressures down there. There's higher system pressures, so the likelihood of of failure is a little higher because you get a higher pressure, um, which stresses the pipe a little more than a low pressure area. Uh, so those are those are assets that we want to pay attention to a little more um, than, let's say, you know, an asset out here with a likelihood of failure um, and the consequence of failure is a is a little low. From a facility side of things, looking at the what are the top um, nine assets on that on that business risk exposure scale here, and um, these two assets are is interesting that they scared, scored so high, but they have a high a high the likelihood of failure score was high enough, but and the consequence of failure score is pretty low. Um, these assets uh, right now are offline. But if there was a ben if you had a benzene hit again, you have to bring this back on. Right now, the potential for them to fail is fairly high because they're old. Um, but so the mitigation measurement at this point in time it is to replace those um, when and if um, benzene becomes an issue for you again. Uh, so down the line, you talk about wh how it would be, what the failure mode would be, and the uh, in particular, we can talk about this one. The the tank is an interesting one. Um, it's very, very, very unlikely to fail. Um, the consequence of the failing, however, is very high. So.
So it ranks, uh, from a risk standpoint, it ranks high. And then one of the, the issues, or the, the failure mode where it potentially fails based on the level of service, not necessarily on mortality at this point in time. If it was, this was 75 years from now, or 100 years from now, that failure mode may change. But at this point in time, it's not. If it developed a crack or it developed um, some issues, we uh, recommend rehabilitation. But in the short term, really monitoring. And most assets in the short term, you're looking at monitoring as uh, the investment for the, the short term action on how you manage your system. Capital investments in the short term, what we're recommending of the, uh, the district, put money towards these projects. Uh, first one here is Willie Love Prospect. Um, Water main, there's about 4,000 feet of 8 inch um, cast iron main in this area. There's there's water quality issues that have come up uh, associated with those that area, uh, and we estimate the budget is a million dollars. Yeah. On the supply side of things, that quarter well was improvements that we talked about a couple of slides ago. Uh, at General Sullivan well, again, those improvements associated with uh, adding availability of having remote communications and having automation of the chemical dosage is important at that, that facility as well. And then storage tank, I'm sure it gets inspected on a routine uh, basis. There's some, some maintenance costs associated with that. And then on the back end, we've got distribution. Um, in the short term, over the next five, ten years, we recommend uh, looking at how the uh, how the district could look at the replacement of uh, water mains down near the mill uh, that are past that are over past that. Uh, some of those are in great shape. They're duct the iron. They've been replaced, and so it's part of the, the tank project. But the ones that are cast iron, the ones that are original, at some point in time, uh, probably some near future, those should, those should be replaced as well. Uh, and then beyond that, looking at at the supply, looking at doing some preliminary investigation for an additional groundwater source. You know, that's the avenue that, that we're recommending at this point in time. That's the district's, it is the district's desire to look at interconnections as opposed to a uh, groundwater source. That money could be allocated towards doing some investigations associated with uh, interconnections. Um, looking at the distribution system improvements, uh, this is just, this is Willie Street here. And so, Willie, Willie Street, it's like got Prospect and Locust. Or did I get it backwards? But I am. There's one of the, the street we recommend going after first would be Willie Street. Um, and the potential estimate of cost for replacement of that line would be, it's about a thousand feet of warming. That's approximately Two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars worth of work. On the long-term side of things, developing additional groundwater source or making that interconnection to another community important. Uh, again, keeping up with storage tank cleaning and inspecting, uh, and then replacing the remainder of the cast iron pipe in the system. So, how do we pay for this? That is a million-dollar question, right? Um, $4 million question, yes. That is the $4 million question. So um, that there's a probably going to be a combination of, of things here. Um, we've got, you know what, how, do you, how, can you, how can you pay for things as a district? You've got cash. Um, what do you have in your bank account? And you've got uh, water rate adjustments. And that's a decision that needs to be made by both the rate payers and <laughs> by the commissioners, and so that's, that's something that needs to get understood. Um, and then you could potentially adjust rates, you could potentially develop this as a debt service charge, which is independent of rates, um, but would be a charge related directly to the improvements. Um, you could, so those are the three different ways you really functionally work. One of the, the programs that you can use, the next four items here, um, the municipal bond bank, you could go to your regular bank, get a loan, 
Um, the Drinking Water SRF program, which is a low interest loan principal forgiveness program through the state. The Drinking Water Trust Fund is another option. Um, it's kind of linked to the state, but a different program. They have a loan and grant program as well. Uh, and then there's a USDA, the Rural Development. Uh, they also offer loans and grants to community water systems. Um, one of the things I think that would help um, the district uh, in the short term understand, get a better handle on, or get a better potential rate and qualify for better principal forgiveness would be to develop a, an income survey for the service area um, or find the median household income to include just the service area and not some of the surrounding areas that get bolted into um, the generic uh, Wallensford MHI. And so if, if the understanding is that that MHI is lower within the district, then uh, there's potential to, for better grant, loan, and principal forgiveness terms through these those last three programs. So, uh, moving forward, what do we want to do here? Uh, well, continue collecting information on missing assets uh, and asset characteristics for finding information you have associated with, with inspections. Um, recently, the district's done a really good job with developing workflows and inspections and, and um, cataloging a lot of information associated with the uh, both the operations of the district and their facilities and obtaining getting a lot of that record information into the, the GIS um, and so that's really good information that you want to be able to use to develop and drive those database decisions um, I would recommend reviewing that level of service agreement annually understand where we are if we want to adjust any of those level of service goals um, moving forward or adjust how the system is operating to meet those level of service goals. And then again, um, you're going to have to be looking at rates and saying, all right, well, how, what? how do we make this all work at the end of the day from a financial perspective? Um, that's, and that's the key to the, the whole thing is really is understanding the and that's the key to asset management, right? If we're looking at level of service, we want to be providing the most cost-effective delivery of service at the level of service that the customer should be getting. So, you know, that's my presentation. I appreciate the time. Um, I want to thank the district, um, the district's operators, at the, and um, the state of New Hampshire for providing the matching grant to do this work. Thank you very much. Okay, one of, one of the questions that has crossed my mind and has crossed the commissioner's mind is, how much of a empirical data do you have for the assumptions that you have made in this study? Empirical data, not yes, but I know. Most of the, the so are you talking about the capital improvement recommendations or the risk exposure information? Risk exposure. So the risk exposure, most of the risk exposure, in, well, it's, a lot of this is explained in the report. Do you want to dig in? I'm sure you have. <laughs> um, but a lot of this information is based on um, ranking criteria that's been developed uh, based on uh, the available information. There is some information where we're, we're basing the level of risk on an unknown level of risk. So if we don't understand, let's say we'll use a pipe for in, as a for instance. Um, we don't understand when that pipe was installed or what material that pipe was installed is. There's sort of a, a middle tier level of risk that we're going to assume. We're not going to assume it's at the top of the list and we're not going to assume it's at the bottom of the list. 
But as you continue to develop that information, you can refine that risk to say, all right, well, I dug this pipe up. It's a ductile iron pipe, which means it was installed after 1970. So I can conservatively estimate it at a maximum of that date. So you put that information back in and reduce the level of risk that we're assigned to that. OK, so what you're saying is you're estimating risk. You don't know. You didn't do like a hydrology report. A, hydro a, a flow rate. You didn't scope the lines. You didn't um, do a leak test. You didn't do any of that. You just sort of assume things based on general data, right? There, we did both. So we developed a hydraulic model. There was flow tests that we did do in the system. And so there's, there was, we did six tests out in the system to calibrate hydraulic model that we developed. Say, all right, well, these are the, this is how much flow you can get throughout the system you know, based on the data that we did collect. So there's, there's obviously some assumption associated with it, but we went out and we calibrated it, field calibrated it, the model to ensure that it's as good as we can get. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. All right. A couple of questions I have. You did not scope the pipes, and I'm specifically asking about Willie Street. Everybody's talked about Willie Street. Yep. And I got all kinds of estimates. We actually looked at the pipes, put a scope down there, and said, wait a minute, it's rusting out, it's fine, whatever. I have not scoped the pipes as part of the work that. Um, Ray did when he installed the automatic flow, me flow meter, or sorry, not flow meter, uh, the flushing um, unit down in the middle of the, in the gully there. Um, cut, up, cut out a piece of pipe and taking a look at that piece of pipe. It's half full of um, tuberculation. So it's effectively rusting from the inside. Uh, I don't have a picture of it in my presentation. Um, but I think Ray's got a picture of, of it here. So. But yes, um, one of the things that I was going to bring the pipe, I apologize, it was larger than I can handle. So at the thirty-first meeting, I can cut a section out. I'll have it here. Like, we witnessed it. Next, next question. Where'd you get the cost of one point two million? The one point two million dollars for the. So that is what you're referring to is. So the $1.2 million uh, is we use our typical estimate for 8-inch pipe, a replacement cost of 8-inch pipe, including uh, pavement above it, is approximately $200 a foot. Uh, and did, that so, did that include the paving, that uh, the repaving, or? That includes uh, trench patch paving. And so that cost, if, if the district is looking to pave full width, there's some additional cost potentially there as well. I don't know if that's a condition. That what, what kind of pipe are we looking at to replace that? And if that would be, right now, we would be recommending 8-inch dumper wire pipe. So there's potentially cost to bring that if you're looking at um, replacing with a different water main material type, one to go to PVC that's Correct. less expensive. Than Correct me if I'm wrong, and, and but the research I'm coming up with, a lot of the places are going to a plastic pipe, PVC, because of the not only the cost factor, but the life expectancy, the fact that it doesn't corrode. Is that a reasonable cost? And what's the cost comparison in that versus the duct? PVC is, is a less expensive product, so there would potentially be cost savings there. We've, um, it's, we've specified and, and installed um, PVC, ductile iron, PE. They're all acceptable pipe materials. And cost-wise? Cost-wise, PVC would be less expensive than ductile. 20%, 40%? Um, from a material standpoint, it's, yeah, it's, I'd say 20%. Yeah. One last thing. Hydrology study, actual study of where potential wells could be in town. You mentioned that repeatedly in there. Has, did you even look at potential sites or? As part of this effort, we did not look at potential sites. That, um, there are a number of companies that out there that, that could do that. Wright Pierce is one of them. Um, we do have 
hydrologist on staff, or hydrogeologist on staff. So that would be a whole nother study we'd have to do. That would be yes, additional effort. Are the current wells that we have functioning properly? The current wells, that, are they functioning properly? To the best of my understanding, they are optimized, given that what you currently are, are doing. Thank you. Thank you. the district and the income within the district, which is lower than the income in the entire town, which I think you were pointing out in your remarks, we can get that survey done through the Department of Environmental Services. They will assist us with that. We don't have to go door to door. We can bring in consultants who would help us with that. And the interest rates begin at a very modest level, not 5.5%, but under 4%. So I think I think what's important here is I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. What I'm trying to say is we need maximum information to make good informed decisions. We don't want to be, we can't neglect an unhealthy water situation on Willie Street just because we think it costs too much. I think we need to go further and do the research and pull together the information to see what our town can do. And also get some help from DBS Uh, difference in life expectancy between PVC pipe and the other pipe that was originally poured. Uh, both of them have similar life expectancy. What's the uh, difference in water quality due to the PVC? There are, right now, there, there's not good information to say either way as far as PVC versus um, ductile iron if there are water quality or so firm water quality impacts related to PVC, bleaching, things like that. that oh, I'm sorry. There, both 
ductile iron and PVC and, and PE, they're all approved as um, appropriate pipe for water main installation by the American War Works Association. Probably the best information I can give you there. Okay. Is it on? Can you hear me? So what type of material do you see most commonly used in the water? It's a mix, really. Uh, so uh, like I said, uh, we've installed PVC, ductile iron, HDPE. A lot of it depends on uh, the application. Uh, but a lot of communities historically have used ductile iron. Um, it, at this point in time, is more expensive, and a lot of communities have standardized around it and they want to continue to use it, but uh, the community who wanted to use PVC, because it's more economical, it's totally a good way to go. Are there additional long-term costs because of um, incompatibility of materials or connection points or things like that as a result of having multiple materials within the system? Not necessarily. Um, the a lot of the, the PVC, a lot of the pipes are, they're all uh, compatible with each other. They're either sized as ductile iron pipe size or iron pipe size. And most of the water main that goes to the ground is specified and installed as ductile iron pipe size. So uh, as far as compatibility goes in correcting or uh, installing, uh, but as long as you have the appropriate parts on site, it should be in good shape. Hope that wasn't. Uh, PVC, is there any problems with like if you have to keep the water and they get a chemical stolen in PVC long term? Not that I know. Okay. Um, my question, I guess, is to the commissioners. Um, I'm sensing a little skepticism on your with this report. I'm just wondering, do you see this as a valid report? Do you support these findings or do you have, you know, issues with these findings? That's okay. Can you actually hear? Yeah, there we go. No, there's nothing wrong with the report. Um, the problem is, what is the priorities? Now, clearly, the Willie Street area has been a priority for uh, a long time. A long time. So, why it wasn't fixed earlier, I don't know. The point is, we're trying to figure out how to best get that done as quickly as possible at a reasonable rate, because they're going to have to borrow money. And, and that's that's my take on it, and I think I speak for all the commissioners on that. It's a matter of how do we get this done as quickly as possible, at a reasonable price. When he says 20 to 30 percent cheaper on the pipe, that takes it from 1.2 million down to about 800,000. It's a lot less money. And that gets people's pipes and their, hopefully, their water to their house done sooner, better. And that's what I'm looking for. It, that answer your question? Excuse me. My question is to do with Willie Street and Willie Street alone. The difference between 200000 and $300,000 versus the $1.2 million you have up there, what does that price actually include when you come up with that estimate? Sorry, the two hundred to $300,000, you mean? Or just the one point two generally? I'm talking about the uh, $200,000 to $300,000, Willie Street alone. So that, I put that up there just to... Um, 
throw out an option to sort of start that process on that in this area as far as replacement. And so if you did this kind of as a phase one, it would be um, the water main, the valves, the hydrants, the water services, and the pavement as well. Yeah, so they're, they're Yes, and that, that's an estimated cost. And so because this 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 road in particular, it's the straight shot, there's not a lot else in the road, there's there's sewer there and there's a drainage culvert that we gotta cross, but there's not a lot of other utilities in there. It's a pretty straight run, it's pretty um, I wouldn't call it simple because digging in the ground is never simple. Uh, but it's a pretty straightforward project. Um, you could um, so the engineering would be uh, super significant. You could probably even work with a contractor to just do this work um, if you had the cash to do it. If you needed to go through um, an SRF program or if you needed to go through uh, one of the grant and loan programs, you have to have an engineer product. It's just the way that they work. Thank you. So, uh, so um, along with Clem's question, my question is about the longevity. If, if there's a very, if there's a difference in pricing for the various kinds of uh, fabric you could use to do this work, is there a longevity issue that we should be concerned about too? The, it, with the materials that they have now, uh, with the PVC in particular, um, that materials come a long way. Uh, there used to be some issues with uh, PVC, the, the Blue Brute in particular. Um, it has, uh, if it was installed with a little bit of tension, uh, and 30, 40 years down the line, someone decided they were going to tap that line, it could, it could blow up right in their face. You know, it's, there's some serious potential hazards with it. But um, the stuff that they have now is a little more flexible. Um, but from a longevity standpoint, they're both the, the PVC folks who um, push BBC and the folks who push PE um, and the folks who push ductile, they all say their product lasts the longest. But um, they're all right around the same time frame. Um, with the ductile, there's potential for corrosion um, because it is a metallic pipe. Um, but it all depends on the materials that are surrounding the pipe. Um, and in this particular case, I don't know if, if, Ray, when you dug that pipe up, if you observed any exterior corrosion, on that cast iron. So um, maybe PVC is a better option in this application. Uh, no offense to you, sir. This is a question to the commissioners. Uh, and I apologize that this has already been addressed. Has anybody else given us any pricing to do this project or? Just these folks here. This, are you talking about just Willie Street, or are you talking about this the whole big, the whole Yeah, the whole presentation. Uh, we never investigated anything beyond Willie Street because that was the only thing that evidence needing replacement. In fact, we still are looking for evidence that Locus or Crossfit needs replacement. If it's happening, then we need a little more evidence. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess my, my, my question is to my question to her. Uh, I'm, I, I own the house here in Rollinsford. Um, I just got three quotes to do a floor in my house. It was only, you know, I got quotes from, you know, for 5000 bucks and all the way down to 400 bucks. It's like, no offense to you, sir. But it's like, we are we investigating other options and getting other competitive bids to find the best solution for the problems for our town? One of the responsibilities of the commissioners is to get as much information as possible, not from just one source. We'd like to take a look at, like, what's inside those pipes, okay? Is the problem on Willie Street isolated or is it spreading? Well, we'd like to know before we plunk down $1.2 million. I think that's only reasonably, fiscally proven. Yeah. 
All right, I'll speak into the mic. Is that okay now? Yes, sir. Thank you. In answer to your question, part of it, Bully Street was developed here. Right. We have more than one person. You know, more than one person turn around and give us an estimate of what's going to happen. Are we Yeah. Are we Well, I went to the lowest bidder one time on another project 30 years ago, and I got raked over the coals because it wasn't the local contract. So, if you turn around to it again this time, I would recommend picking the first, picking the first three contracts to come in. Okay, people insist on the lowest bid, and that's what we go. Now, plan, you remember that sewer improvement project we did in downtown? It wasn't, it was the lowest bid, but you remember what we had to go through. So uh, another question for you. I noticed in your, if you could go back to the slide that shows the Willie Street project with the other five items that, that it's hard to see, but uh, you identified the six projects and how much each of them would cost. And it says short term up there. What is the term we're talking about? And does it make sense to, does it make any kind of sense to package together what we're trying to do and seeking financing for the capital projects that are in that short term, on that short term list. Yeah, the, the, the two that I would potentially look at packaging together are the facilities projects because they're both similar in nature and um, similar in scope. Uh, the, but those could be done independently. It really depends on how, uh, how quickly the district would like to move forward on the projects and in, in what order. So it's really up to the district. We have side. another consideration, and that is most of the loan uh, sources, uh, Community Bond Bank, RDA, for Department of Agriculture, will write loans for the useful life of that item. So generally, water lines are like 25 years to 30 years. Uh, equipment upgrades to a well may be 10 years. So they can't be in the same loan. So we have to do separate loan applications and separate bond repay or loan repayments. It's not as simple as let's just get a pot of 1.2 million, 1.455 million dollars to spread it around. We can't do that. Not with our funding sources. Well, my question is based on the rates where the rates are today, and how does where the rate are today correspond to forgiveness when you want to get free money from the state or from different programs? Given uh, both the MHI of Rollinsburg and the rates, um, there's, I don't believe the district qualifies currently for uh, the principal forgiveness or the 10% uh, forgiveness at this point in time. So um, to qualify for that, that either as a rate adjustment or as an MHI adjustment uh, that the district could get up with. So we don't, so the rates aren't high enough to qualify for free money? The, I suppose so. It's, it's, well, first off, it's not, not free money. It's principal forgiveness. So, it's, it's, DES is, it's not a grant, but it's, it's, they're forgiving principal on the loan, so effectively a similar thing. But yes, the, if Rollinsford put in a, uh, a Rollinsford district, or so a district put in a, an application for um, a project, they would not qualify for principal forgiveness at this point in time.
sorry. Uh, the the way that uh, the way that SRF program uh, applies principle forgiveness, it's based on the 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 cost of water for an uh, average cost of water uh, divided by the MHI. And so if it doesn't go, it doesn't medium median household income. I'm sorry. Uh, so in Rollinsford's circumstance, based on, uh, like Vern had said earlier, the MHI includes a lot of folks on the other side of group four. So if MHI is, is inflated compared to what the MHI is in service area, um, it's not re accurately reflecting the impact to the people being served. So if uh, the district was to engage somebody like uh, DES or RCAP services to develop a uh, an income survey for the area it served. And it really, well, I, can, I can get you guys in touch with those those folks who do those income surveys and very reasonable rates associated with the, those services. Um, you can get a better handle on what the income, or the, the mean household income in the district area is. This question is for the commissioners. Um, would you be willing, or what is your willingness to undergo a rate, or sorry, an income survey within the district so that we can accurately understand our medium household income? And what would your timeline be for this? It, I feel, I'm wondering what your timeline is for action based on this, whether it be an MHI survey or anything else, because here we are in July. Did you want to respond to that? It is my understanding it's done by DES, is that correct? It would be done by DES, RCAP services. There's a number of organizations. Granite State Rural Water does them. There's, there's a number of organizations that um, support communities in those endeavors. On the surface, it sounds like a great idea, but having just had it sprung on us about three minutes ago, um, I'm sure not going to make a decision until we find out what the actual cost is, because we may find out the cost of these surveys, like so many of them, actually cost more than just paying to fix this stuff, and that's part of what we have to take a look at, because all of these surveys sound wonderful, but that doesn't fix the water line on Willie Street or any of these other things, so... It is a matter of trying to get the bill down as cheaply as possible. There's also another source that we look at. Potentially, there are uh, independent banks that invest in this sort of thing. It doesn't matter what your income is. The rate is a little higher, but sometimes the cost is cheaper on that. And we did find out about that. And then again, it's a matter of sitting down and comparing apples to oranges and decide what we want. The, the, the objective here is to get this fixed, not to hold 20 studies on it. I don't think it helps these people that are living on Willie Street one bit that this, keep, this keeps getting kicked down the road. The secret is to get this done as quickly as possible. But here we are in July. What are the next steps? Okay. Here we are in July. We've been here, what, three months now? No. This is not the first. This is not the first project that we've had to tackle on this. So, are we going to work on this? Yes. Am I going to get it done this week? No. Um, I think these people want it done in a reasonable period of time, and I think that's a reasonable expectation. It's a matter of sitting down and figuring out what we have. Again, I didn't know about this survey. I do know about the other surveys on the income. I know that's been a problem. I know when Jay Roy was running the school, that was part of the reason why the school was so expensive. We didn't get any money because we have a lot of wealthy people here in town. So that's going to change it. Furthermore, all the building of new houses changes the demographics rather substantially down in the downtown area. Some of them are still in the downtown area. The purpose is, is to survey the folks who are being served by the water system. Uh, 
Okay, is this better? Um, just quickly, what do you consider a reasonable amount of time? Are we talking uh, like six months would be a reasonable amount, like one year or two years? Off the top of your head, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but when you say reasonable, I, I'm new to this, so I, just, I mean, one year, six months? Yeah. If we're talking about borrowing, we're talking about waiting until next March to have voter approval to issue debt, and then after that, we go into building. But first, you have to have an annual meeting to authorize bonding. So, not before March. Tactically, it's not a good idea. First of all, people don't like digging in the winter, and the town doesn't like us digging in their roads in the winter. So March seems like the best time to get the ball really rolling. It's going to take us four to six months just to get the funding in place, to have it votable in March. So we're looking in March before the ball really gets rolling. So one year, one year would be the reasonable amount of time. Not more than a year, right? So when you say reasonable, I mean five years. That that would that would be unreasonable, right? I'm just I'm just trying to I'm not trying to be. Uh, no, no, that's a reasonable question. So yeah, so I would like I mean, to see it done sooner, right? As as he's explained, it's not what we want to do. This and I and I think we can all understand that. I mean, but we want. I mean, I'm two houses down, and I have friends on Willie Street. So uh, when you say reasonable, I'm just trying to get an idea, frame of reference as to. What to expect, that's all. Sooner rather than later is my outcome. Again, it depends on what, what we're going to get from money and how much it costs. The soonest we can do it is sometime after March 2020. That's the soonest. And no, we're not going to scary court to call for special meetings for bonding because as a person who's gone through this process before, that brings out some rather angry people who both know. Uh, you're talking about just in terms of uh, the rates or how we'll how we'll put together the money to pay for this. Have you guys looked at like a cash flow study? I, I'm told I've heard that uh, you know certain bonds that we're currently covering are going to be ending soon within the next six or so months. I, I don't know if that's still accurate. Is that, do you have anything to say on this? Don't listen to rumor. We have audits that will tell you. We have a major bond that won't retire until 2030. We have a very small bond that will, will retire in 2022, but it's only ten thousand dollars. That's the final payment. Oh yes, 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 yes. We have an audit coming out, uh, an audit report coming out. Explain that. Okay. Yes, we will we're not be, rolling in money. Will that be available to? Oh, it's a public document. Since the auditor has recommended the last three years that the rates be increased, why aren't you doing that now? Actually, he didn't recommend a rate increase. He recommended cutting expenses first and then consider a rate increase. I have the reports at home. I read them carefully. I've There are other ways to accomplish this. I mean, looking back about a year, we had meetings done at the water district. They were collaborative, they were open. We heard things we didn't like, but it wasn't a hostile environment, and I just feel as though we're not, there's not a lot of transparency, and you bark at us because we don't know any better, but we don't know because it's not available to us. So I'm feeling very frustrated with this process, and you're shutting people down, and I don't understand it. We want what's best for the community and for the town, and we're just trying to get there.
so my latest question for you um, is about the rates. I, I'm not exactly entirely sure about our rates being really uh, low, because I don't find them to be that way, paying water and sewer in Portsmouth and paying it here. I don't find them to be particularly low. So my question for you is, how is that ratio, what is it that makes our rates look so high? Is it the amount of water that is assigned to each dwelling, which is much higher than the rate, the amount of water that I ever use? Um, are those factored into, can we, I, I know you want to avoid survey, but I'm curious about whether that might help us have a better, a more advantageous position in getting a good interest rate and maybe digging a little deeper in the four months that we're trying to research getting um, financing for this, maybe get some more data. I'm, I'm curious because I don't, I don't feel like our rates are low and so I want to understand how that's a set, how that's determined because it doesn't make sense to me uh, paying two places. Doesn't make sense to me either. I think it's pretty hard to compare with the Roman community. We have roughly 700 some people using water here in town. Those are only households. What do you think of the income base that we have? I'm sorry. What, what I'm saying is that we can't compare all of the surrounding communities. You, excuse me, I'm doing it again. You, you gotta eat it, go ahead. <laughs> ah. Those that over 28,000 households are using. Wallace has got 700 somewhat houses. Wallace has got even a lot more. Some of us got a lot more. We're not in the same boat as the other computers, but our costs are about the, the, costs are about the same as far as operating Because we have to get the people that are qualified to do the job. Now, yeah, we are high. We're trying to see our way through what we're trying to do right now. But how it's going to end up, I can't tell you. But you can take into account the size of the community we're dealing with versus the size of the city. Like apples and oranges. The formal term is economies of scale. Some of it's traditional. The do well street is about 200,000, correct? Yeah. Correct, that's our estimate right now. So why don't we just do Willie Street for one year and then go to you know, do what's necessary on Willie Street and then do the rest later down, instead of trying to do 1.45 million, 200,000 a little bit easier to swallow than 1.45. That that's absolutely a way that the district could move forward and move this that project forward in a phased perspective. They could do Willie Street on, on year one, and, um, and while they're doing that, take a look and see uh, if they need it or look and do more investigations into what the conditions of the main are on Prospect and Locust. They could keep doing that while it's being constructed and um, make decisions based on the information that they find on. Um, Prospect and, and locus at that point. So basically, just do baby steps and do what is necessary for you on it. And I think that's very logical. As a homeowner, we do that with our own homes and our businesses. We prioritize what is the most critical and go from there. So we don't need to bond 1.45 today. We just yeah. do our thousand. I think we're done. Thanks again, everyone. Appreciate uh, the I'd like to thank the American Legion for renting us this room. I really love this place. Have a good night, everyone. Uh, all right. Motion to adjourn.
We're adjourned.